So my name is Chris Clark. I grew up in upstate New York, and I started out as a Spanish teacher. And in 1982, I uh, started a series of jobs related to educational technology. So my job was to help teachers, college teachers and high school teachers, figure out good ways to use technology. Um, I retired from the University of Notre Dame, which is where my last such job was in 2019. And since then, I've been active in local environmental causes and at the History Center. I also hiked 500 miles on the Way of St. James in Spain. But I've been learning about my family since I was 12, um, interviewing uncles in New York, um, let's see, finding deeds in Virginia, rubbing tombstones in Ireland, collaborating with cousins who are, I didn't go to the Dominican Republic, but they live there. Um, and helping index the US, the, 18, the 1950 US census, uh, and just sort of generally scouring the internet and, and more. So that's a little bit about me. Well, I'm Judy Thomas, and I um, came to, uh, retired here in uh, Saugatux in 2006. I was a computer programmer. So I have no background in history or uh, family search, but in, the winter of 2017, I was looking through a box of pictures my m mother had left me, and I found a journal written by my great-grandmother, Minnie Westbrook Smith. She was a foundling and born in 1867, abandoned in at the Washington House Hotel in Worcester, Ohio, and grew up in the Wayne County Infirmary, the Poor House. Her biological mother contacted her in 1890 and told her about her maternal family, but would not identify her father. I have been interested, I've never been interested in history or family history, but after reading her story, I wanted to learn more. Since that day, I have been actively building my knowledge of family history and along the way, learning about online resources, record types, um, best practices when researching, and much more. Through this journey, I have met people who have helped me, and I love helping others find their family history. So our goal today is basically to help you show you how to get started in researching your family history. We're going to provide some broad steps and some general advice, as well as resources to help you build your family tree. On your handouts, you're going to see six steps. If you turn to the second page of your handout, there's a worksheet. And when we were putting this, this session together, that's right, when we were putting this session together, I came through some things that you, I, I could ask people to do while we were going through this. And we decided that maybe we'll just, we'll do one or two of those and just leave that rest of that for you as just a way to sort of get you started thinking about some of the things that'll help you begin to move forward in doing your family history. As this slide indicates, you want to start with yourself and write down a timeline of significant events in your life. Next, work on your mother and then your father and so on, working your way back in time. Concentrate on one person at a time. Later in the presentation, we will give you some forms that might help you with this process. Decide what you want to learn. Identify the questions you would like to answer about your family history. For myself, I had two goals back in 2017. The first was to fact check my grandmother, Thomas's assertion that we were related to Thomas Elva S. Edison. Her maiden name was Edison. After a good amount of research, I found out that my grandmother was correct. I am a half first cousin three times removed. <laughs> we sh he shares a grandfather and I share a third great grandfather, Samuel Ogden Edison. Samuel was married twice, making me a half instead of a, a full cousin. My second goal was to verify the evidence presented in Minnie's journal regarding her mother's family. This is an ongoing uh, project. I have lots of goals, right? But right now, my goal is to learn more about my, my family's first Clarks in the US. They arrived in Philadelphia in 1854, and this is the birth record in England for my third great grandmother, right? So you can see 
there's a, this is sort of a normal line above here, and this is Clara Maria Harrington, but there's only a mother listed. I suspect that um, daddy either took a powder, wasn't good enough for the Harrington parents, or maybe was somebody else's husband. So she was born somewhere else um, from where she lived, and so I, I don't know, but that's just a theory, and I probably will never know. So to, to begin researching your family history, contact your oldest relative to gather what information they know. Set up interviews um, by phone, face to face, or through emails or, or letters, and come prepare with questions. Ask if they have family records or, mem or memorabilia, such as family histories, Bibles, photographs, newspaper clippings, diaries, letters, scrapbooks, baby books, funeral bulletins, I can go on and on. Don't forget to inquire about the family traditions, the stories, the legends, and or special occasions that are meanif meaningful to your family he heritage. Next, interview other living relatives for their insight into the family history. As you uncover new details, take thorough notes and add everything to you learn to your f growing family archive. So I was lucky enough to come into contact, as I mentioned earlier, with some distant cousins in the Dominican Republic. My grandmother's grandmother was Dominican. And, uh, and I actually have met some of my, a couple of my fourth cousins who are from the Dominican Republic. But I happened to uh, come in contact with some people who were looking into parts of the family tree. And one of them was very generous and sent me a couple of books wherein part of my family tree is, is laid out, which is pretty cool. This guy, Emilio Nilting, on the right was my great-grandfather's half-brother. And he was a somewhat famous French chemist. And I think his family paid for this research to be done. Ask your extended family members if they know of anyone who has done or is currently doing family history research. If the answer is yes, ask that person or persons if, you, if they will co collaborate with you. Thousands of family histories have been published. They can be found online in, in places like Google Books or libraries or historical societies. The, books, uh, the book on the right the Cluel family, um, you will find a story of Lu Louise Cluel, my sixth great-grandmother, who arrived in Philadelphia in 1737. The genealogy of the Cluel family after they arrived is in this book and biolog biographical sketches. It was published in 1907 in preparation for a 1909 uh, Cluel family reunion. The histories are not the final word about your family history, but they're a great resource. There may be errors in this history. You will need to verify the information. So I, we can't stress this enough. You want to be organized. You want to record your sources for everything that you find out because you may need to go back and sort of, maybe I misread that, or, or maybe you find, you think there could be other bits of information in that same source that you didn't know you needed when you first started. So write everything down, including where you found it, and if someone gave it to you, write, make a note of that. When you talk to people, keep notes, or better yet, use your phone to make a, a, a voice recording of the little interview that you have with people and save that somewhere. There are lots of different ways you can do this. You can make photocopies of things. You can take pictures of, of documents with your phone right, and save those. Um, create some kind of an organizational system that works for you. I used just the names of the, the branches of the family, the surnames, and kept folders for a while. At a minimum, keep a research journal. Right? I, I mean, you can do, use something as simple as a spiral notebook like this, or you can get a nice little journal, leather copy journal. A lot of people are doing that now. You know, they write their journals of, the, of what they do every day. And if you have one that's just for your family history research, it'll have all your notes. And just as you do it, just keep track of, of what you did, who you talked to, when you talked to them, where you were, 
it doesn't have to be super detailed, but keep track of the input. You don't have to sort of flesh it out with lots of extra words, but keep track of the important details. You know, who, what, when, those kinds of things, what you find. So you can use manila folders, right? When I started doing this, this I've had this box for probably 30 years. And in that, though, there are folders full of different information about different families. Now, I haven't added paper to this in quite a few years, right? Because I'm pretty much doing everything dis digitally. And I've also kind of learned most of what I think I'm going to be able to learn about the different parts of my family. Um, in order to go farther, I'm going to have to maybe travel abroad some more to, to get deeper. This is an example of what they call a pedigree chart. This chart is of your direct ancestor, your mother and your father, your maternal grandparents, and your maternal great-grandparents. By tradition, uh, most pedigree charts will have the paternal line at the top and the maternal line at the bottom. Here is you, and your mother's line is coming down, and it's marked in red, and your father's line is going up and marked in purple or blue. This view of your family tree does not include your siblings, your cousins, your aunts and uncles, but you will find that knowing who they are will help provide you with your direct ancestors. Now this other form is called a group sheet, and this form encapsulates a single family. Use one for each of your family members. For example, one for yourself, one for your mother, one for your father, etc. First, fill in as much as you can on this sheet. Don't worry if it's correct. Um, you will verify it later. As you obtain information, add the data to the appropriate sheet and make the corrections. If you would rather create a journal, like Chris was talking about, set aside a page for each person and add your information to it. To uncover full stories of your ancestors, it's important to go beyond the basic trifecta of birth, marriage, and death records. The most people, that, those are the records that most people rely on. While these vital records help to differentiate John, Fish, John Smith from another John Smith, uh, they don't provide information a complete picture. To truly understand your ancestors' lives, seek out additional information like divorce records or military service. Where did they go to college? What church were they affiliated with? What places did they live in? Um, um, and family traditions or lore. These details will weave uh, together a rich and complex story of who they were. On the front of the handout, there's a link to a web page. And so the handouts are in there, but there are also links to all kinds of things, including those two forms, right? The, the pedigree form and the family group form. And if you're comfortable with technology, you can, you can fill those out digitally. They are, they are what a fill out form types of things. So you could create multiple copies of the family group and actually type the data in and save it Right? And then when you know more or you correct something, you just come open it back up and type it in again, if that's how you, if that's how you roll. Document everything. Think of yourself as a detective. You're solving a mystery. Is your information reliable? Right? And if it's not, some, sometimes the way to figure out if it's reliable is to find another confirming source. Right? What other information have you found that might confirm what you found? Does the information, if you have a, th a hypothesis, right, does the information you find confirm that hypothesis or maybe suggest that you might want to change it? Um, again, document what you find. Keep track of, of how you learned what you learned. This is a, a World War II registration card. So all the men were required to sign up, sign in with one of these cards. And it's a treasure trove of information. You'll find, um, the ancestor's full name, you'll find where they were living, you will find um, their birth date, where they, the place they were born um, in Wales. You even, there's who to contact, that might be a relative, so that might be interesting for you. And lots of times you'll find his signature, and so that, or her, his signature. 
this happens to be my grandfather. <laughs> and when I found this, I had no question that this was my grandfather. I grew up next door to my grandfather, and that's my grandmother, Maria Dolores, right? The, the one who was descended from the Dominican grandmother. That was her grandmother's name, Maria Dolores. And my grandfather was born in Wales. So I, that, and I learned through my ancestry DNA that I'm more Welsh than anything else. So I've become rather proud of that. This was a, just a, a wonderful thing. Sometimes you get verification from a source that you're not expecting. So this uh, third great grandfather, this John Randall Clark, and his wife was this Clara Harrington. They had 10 kids. And one of the things when I sort of was kind of running out of things to do, because I love to do this genealogy work, I started tracing each of them down, right? And the first thing was to try to figure out who did they marry? What was their married name? Or did they have kids or anything like that? And so several of them, several of the women, I was pretty sure I had found the, their spouse and their married name, right? I, I was like 80% sure. Well, when I was looking for birth records in this courthouse in Virginia, I found this deed. And this is a deed that my great, great, great grandfather made giving something, or he was selling and, the, and all of his kids had to sign off. So every last one of them there is there with their spouse. And I just went down the list, yes, 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 I had them all right. I knew where they lived in 1880. They're in the 1880 census in this little rural town um, south of Washington, D.C. in Virginia. And so I found where the county courthouse was and I, I decided one day I'm just going to go and, and dig and look for birth, death, marriage records, those kinds of things. And I don't know what made me look in the deeds, but I just looked. Uh, this is uh, an example of uh, a U.S. Census. The um, U.S. Census records are a gold mine of information and help nail down a person's identity. In the U.S. Constant Constitution, the founding fathers uh, mandated that we have a, a census every 10 years. Um, in 1850, the census was the first, in, first to have list the names of all the people in the household. Um, before that, they were only listed the head of the house and the number of people that were by age category. So it's difficult to find your family that way. If you have ancestors living in the U.S. between 1850 and 1950, those are the, um, what are available today, you're most likely to find your ancestor listed. Except the 1890 census was destroyed by fire, so we don't have that, those records. Um, this census record is in my, of my grandfather, Cluel Smith, in 1940. He's listed at the top. He lived in Bay Village, over here, his county was Cuyahoga County, Ohio. He lived on Walker Road. He had a wife, uh, two daughters, and a son. They are, ages are all listed. Um, the age, his age is listed at 48, so if you subtract that from um, the, or add it to the, you know, subtract it from the year of the uh, census, he would have been born approximately 1892. Um, one of the problems with um, census is the census takers um, went door to door and interviewed people in the home and got this inf and re recorded this information. But um, sometimes they re the recording was wrong. And sometimes the na they weren't even home, so they would just interview the neighbor. Mm -hmm. So you have to be cautious because look at um, the Second line, his wife's name is Belda. Her name was Velda with a V. So where that, that came from, I'm not sure. And in investigating my um, Cluel Smith's actual date of birth, it was October 20th, 1890. This, um, it doesn't show on here, but this census was taken in June of 1940. That makes his um, speculated year, year of birth um, to be 1890, or 1891, not um, 92. So in your handout, we've given you a sample of the 1900 census, which is a particularly rich 
source of information. So if you look across the top, if there's a location, and if they're in a city, often the street will be named there and the street addr address where they live, which is cool. So their name, their relation to the whoever the person is that's the, the head of the household. Then the personal description says male, female, color or race, but it says the month and the year they were born. Again, the person who reports to the census taker may be wrong, or they may lie for whatever reason. But it also says, whether they're single or married, how long they've been married. So you, know, you can guess, at least get a basic idea of what, went, what their date of marriage was. And then next to that, it says, how many children have you had and how many are living? So this is really interesting. Right? You may find, for example, that you have a, a grandparent who you only know about they had two kids, but it may say they had five and only two are living. So they may have had three that died in infancy or died young or ran off or who knows. Uh, and, or it could be wrong, right? Um, and it, of course, it tells where they, uh, where they were born and their parents were born. Citizenship, it gives a year when they came to the, the US. It isn't the year of citizenship, it's the year that they came, um, and how, was it how old they were? Number of years they've been in the United States. And again, it could be wrong, right? but it gives you an idea of when they immigrated. So there's just an awful lot. The other thing that I forgot to point out is that um, on these censuses, you want to look at all the people on the page. You want to also look at the maybe the page before and the page after. Because in this case, George Jackson and Edith, Edith is my grandmother's sister. So they live in proximity to each other. Um, and so I would have, you, you gain information from that. So as we've said before, you know, the records can contain mistakes. You will find mistakes, I guarantee it. So you wanna find multiple records to corroborate and you may never know for sure which one is right. Avoid copying from other people's trees without verifying the information yourself. So it's very tempting when you find a, a nice printed out family tree just to copy it down and take it as the God's own truth, right? But you want to be to make sure that you sort of treat it with a grain of salt, you know, before you sort of swear that it's the truth. Try to get some verification for it. And here's some examples of, of how the very varieties of things that you're going to find. So with dates, you may find a date that says it's the birth date, but maybe it's the christening date. Christening meaning baptism, right? And the christening is going to come after it, and it may be a long time after, depending on what faith they were or where they were and how far away the priest was. Um, there are bans versus marriage. Who knows what bans are, right? So bans are basically saying, we're going to get married. It's like a wedding announcement, but it's done through the church. And I think you had to do it three times. And I think at one point, one of the laws was if you do it three times, you're married. You don't actually have to, you know, if you make it the official announcement and register, that means you're married. But typically, I think most people, they would, they would do the announcements and then they get married. So sometimes when you find these, these marriage indexes, they're giving you a date that the ban was posted. So you may find three or four dates that are close, right? But they don't agree. And then you have death date versus burial date. So if you go to a cemetery and the cemetery says, you know, October 5th, they might be listing the burial date. Not that it matters a whole lot if it's, you know, October 5th and not October 3rd, but just be aware that the, there are these different varieties of things. Um, this slide shows how names vary. When you're searching for records and review, reviewing records, look at these kinds of variations. Notice that um, I might have two, uh, my direct line is Chamberlain and um, Chamberlain, one with an A-I-N and one with an I-N. Both are all the way through the tree. They just keep changing them <laughs> over and over again. So um, when I'm searching, I have to search for both names. Also, the given names the, and nicknames and initials are um, make it problematic for searching. So you have to, they might go by their nickname and be registered on a record with their nickname or just initials. So you um, need to hunt for all kinds of things. And then everyone's used to this Newark, Saugatuck Township, Dudleyville, and Douglas. Well, it depends on 
when that record was recorded, what was the name of the town? Um, I have the one fun in the upper right hand corner there you see Clark, Clark E, Clark and Cleary. When my Clarks came they were all Clarkies and at the end of the next generation only one of them kept the E. Um, and as I was looking for the Clark, my, this John, John Clark of all names, right, there were 70 of them in the, in the Philadelphia 1860 census, but I knew he was English, right? There were 50 or 60 Irish John Clarks. And I said, Clark isn't an Irish name. And someone said to me, you know, it was probably, they were probably Clearys or O'Cleary, and they anglicized the name so they'd have a better chance of getting a job. This is interesting. So until 1833, where we are right now was Indian land. In 1830, you can see we're in that sort of dotted area there. This area was part of something called Cass County. Later, it was part of Kalamazoo County. Right? I don't know if you can see that on this map. Um, and uh, Allegan came. County wasn't fully organized until 1835. And of course, Michigan didn't even become a state officially it was a territory until 1837. So you can imagine that if you're looking for really early records, right, if you're looking for that kind of records here, good luck, <laughs> right, in, from 1835. If you're looking for, I don't know how much you're gonna find. But the idea is, you know, the, the boundaries change. And if you're looking for um, ancestors out of the um, US, then um, especially like in Europe, <laughs> Those boundaries the were on change. the move all the time. So one day you were you were German, the next day you were Polish, and the next day you were Austrian. Right. So you just um, have to uh, know the take the study the history of that time and know what you, to in order to find where the records could be kept. It's like Germany, right? There was no such thing as Germany until the late in the 19th century. Right? So you look in these days and they say Prussia. The people were from Prussia or they were from somewhere else. This is the table um, that shows the calculated birth years of my great grandmother, Minnie, on different record types. The record shows her year of birth between 1866 and 1870. Um, people have been known to lie about their age. Sometimes the informant gets it wrong. Minnie was living with her son at the time of her death. You would think that he would have known her birth year, but I believe he did not. This is a page from the log of individuals entering and leaving the Wayne County Infirmary. That's where she was taken. The fourth line on the right side, up here on the, reads, um, uh, May 25th, 1867. Near the bottom, the rec uh, there it reads October 18th, 1867. Most of the entries don't list the year, but we can infer that this is from 1867. In the middle, um, the highlighted line reads, infant, female, child, unknown name, found at Washington House in Worcester and sent to the infirmary October 3rd supposed to be two months old. Minnie was most likely born in, in July or August in 1867, and have, I have yet to find a birth record. So here is the, um, here is a quick look at the website. You can see it's got the handouts here. There's links to resources at the History Center. Boku links to the library. <laughs> Number of free resources that are online. You can search some of the commercial record, and then these are more physical places that you can go to find resources. A little bit about different societies that'll have conferences that perhaps if you get really interested, you might want to go to. These are some, some of the pieces of software that are available. So here's a nice little table that Ingrid has put together back in the library of, of books in the library about getting to work on your family tree. Um, Chris and I are offering, as he said before, help with your family history research at the library. If you are just getting started or if you have been doing this for a while um, and have hit a brick wall, we would love to brainstorm with you uh, about what your next steps are. We will be in the study room on October 5th, 15th and November 19th from 2 to 4. Come on by and bring your questions and brick, wa and brick walls.
Whether we, we won't guarantee. No, we're not going to necessarily do all the research for you. We're, we're there to help you understand where to go and get where to look. Start looking next, and um, the Ancestry uh, Library Edition that it'll be here and you can use for free is a good place to start. Whether you um, want to put something small and simple together for your family, or if you want to find out if you have any heroes or rogues in your family tree, I hope we have given you a place to start. This is, only, this is just getting started. This is, you're, you're writing down what you know, and then we'll help you with where to find these records and to prove your tree.